Um, I'm here to introduce Utkarsh Saxena of Adalat AI. Uh, you know, a lot of us grew up in India and um, grew up disenchanted with justice. I certainly did. Um, you know, there's a famous adage that says, justice delayed is justice denied. And Utkarsh decided to do something about it. Uh, he has developed um, a company that's working on uh, improving the justice system in India by reducing the delays. Please help me welcome a Harvard lawyer, uh, somebody who studied development economics at Oxford and then got a research fellowship at MIT. Uh, that was a mouthful. Welcome, Utkash. Good evening, everyone. I'm very acutely aware that uh, what stands between you and dinner is basically us last one standing. So I'm going to make this as quick as and interesting for all of you. Uh, my name is Utkar Saxena, uh, and I'm the founder of Adalat AI. And many of you would know that Adalat uh, stands for courtroom. And we are uh, stand on the premise that the judicial process should be a pathway to justice, as is expected, and not be a punishment in itself. Yet for countless Indians, as was said in the introduction, the quest for justice is painfully slow, excruciatingly delayed, and as a result, effectively denied. I saw this firsthand when I was a lawyer at the Indian Supreme Court for many years, where I've been practicing for almost over a decade. I saw this from the judge's perspective when I was a law clerk with the justice of the Indian Supreme Court and actually understood what the judges go through dealing with this backlog. It's very easy for us to criticize them, not realizing the low resource, low tech, low tech settings that they actually operate in. And more recently, I actually experienced the legal system as a petitioner when my partner and I petitioned the Indian Supreme Court trying to legalize same-sex marriage in India and experienced all the anxieties and complications that come with that system. Um, in that last situation, unfortunately, you would have read in the papers that we lost that case, but my partner and I went back and got engaged outside the very same court that denied us our rights to say that you will continue to exist and be, fight, be back to fight for marriage equality uh, when the time's right. <clears throat> but in each of these situations, time and time again, it becomes very clear to lawyers and judges who operate at the front end of the legal system but there's actually only so much that you can do about justice when its back end is completely broken. India has 50 million cases pending in courts today, and each case on average takes over a decade to be resolved by the system. At our current pace, it's going to take us 300 years to clear the existing backlog of cases that's clogged in the system. Now, when justice is delayed and denied, it creates a lot of problems for the economy, for business, right? No one trusts the court to enforce your contracts, resolve your disputes, protect your property rights. But at the same time, it becomes a human rights crisis. In India today, there are 75% prisoners in jail who are simply under trials, which means they're not convicted or guilty for any offense or spending sentence. They're only waiting for their cases to be decided and resolved. The process itself, the due process, has literally become the punishment for people waiting for their court dates. India is actually one of the worst performing countries, unfortunately, on this metric, with only 14 other countries in the world having a higher under-trial population in its jails, which includes Yemen, uh, Libya, and the, and the uh, Republic of Congo. When you double-click into these aggregate statistics, you actually realize that like with any broken system, there are stark inequalities streaming at you because this disproportionately hurts the most poor and vulnerable populations. Two-thirds of under-trials in India belong to the lowest caste groups. And you can slice the data from whatever angle. You will find vulnerable and poor people stuck at the bottom of the pyramid of, the, of these prisons. They're stuck in cycles of poverty. They lose integration with society. They're stuck in recidivism traps. Even if they get acquitted after 10 years, to go back to your society and community that you've been disconnected with for over a decade, it's impossible to find a pathway back into community, into employment, and into workforce. I used to have clients who would just come to court because giving up daily wage, having kids being pulled out of school only because they wanted to see that family member who was produced in court because otherwise it was impossible to even see them and meet them in jails. That's the reason for them why families were coming to court again and again for repeated hearings. The process has become the punishment. And most starkly, and this was most frustrating for me as a lawyer, there are legal safeguards against this. One of the provisions of the law states that if you've exceeded more than half of your maximum sentence, 
for an offense that you've been accused of, you should be let go free be just because the system's taking long, you shouldn't be in jail. But to get that petition in court and get it heard also takes time, which is why two thirds of people who are eligible to be released from prison because of delays and backlogs are still languishing in prisons. The process has become the punishment and the court has acknowledged this on multiple occasions. Now in India, there's been a digital revolution in public administration but with biometric IDs and the payment system, but unfortunately the court system has been left behind and there is an urgent need to do something about it. When you diagnose the problem, it's a multi-dimensional problem. There's not gonna be a single silver bullet, but there is one big binding constraint that touches every part of a legal process and that is transcription. Because you see, in a courtroom, nearly every word has to be written down, from oral arguments to cross-examinations to the preparation of judgments. You'd spend a painstaking amount of time preparing a meticulous judicial record and evidence that becomes the basis of judgment. That's the record that goes up and appeals to higher courts. Now, in India, I was frustrated arguing in the fancy courts of Delhi and Bombay, and at the time, I didn't think they were fancy, because the stenographers were slow and untrained and overloaded and overworked. Um, and very often we would be standing in court waiting for the steno to finish typing a sentence before I could ask the next question on a cross-examination. But then I practiced just in the suburbs of Delhi, went to Gurgaon, Ghazibad, went to courts in Bihar and UP and realized there were no stenographers in courts. So judges are actually writing everything by hand even today in the 21st century. Painstakingly from morning to evening in this Indian summer heat, they reduced, our magisterial magistrates have been reduced to the clerical job of note taking. So imagine cross examination, where were you on the night of April 15th, we will all look at the judge and the judge will be writing that question first before you can answer it. And then the judge witness will answer, the judge will hear it, write it down, read it back to you, and then you will disagree about what was said and corrections will be made. Then the judge will get transferred and a new judge will come and not be able to read the handwriting of the judge. It's a complete mess. Enter Adalat AI, a legal Trek nonprofit that's building AI solutions for our justice systems to end judicial delays and improve access to justice. To address this acute shortage of skilled stenographers in the system, our first product is a speech-to-text legal transcription software that's trained extensively on legal data so that it understands all that legal jargon we love showing off with. Uh, that is trained and designed in partnership with stenographers and judges because they are the end users of in very low tech, low resource, difficult circumstances. I'm on multiple WhatsApp groups now with stenographers all over the country, they're my buddies and they regularly send our teams feedback on what kind of product they want. And using AI, this has feedback loops built in so that the learning is not static with every correction that the judge makes or the stenographer makes in the Scopilot setup the model keeps learning and improving and reducing the error rates uh, in the transcription output. Our tech stack is a one-stop shop SaaS platform where a judge and a courtroom logs in and meets all its transcription requirements from dictation to translation, evidence recording, cross-examination. We've designed this in partnership in, within courts so that it can actually be implement, implemented in the courtroom to transcribe and do all its hearings. And based on feedback we got from judges, we've also built a mobile app integrated with that SaaS account because they want to keep working even when they're in the field or when the stenographer is on leave or when they're traveling so that they can simply open their phone and continue dictating judgments and orders to keep the work moving. To ensure that this is inclusive, that languages aren't a barrier, we're offering our services in multiple languages uh, Across, and this is very critical because very often we lawyers from Delhi and Bombay law schools will argue in English, but the witnesses will come and depose in their vernacular language. And that also creates complications in the process. The witness will depose in Hindi, the judge will hear it in Hindi, translate it, then dictate it to the stenographer who will slowly type it in Hindi and English. And then we will all get into arguments about how, how you should have translated from Hindi to English and what was the right way to record it. We've automated the entire process so that in real time, using AI, you can now tra translate and transcribe testimonies in the vernacular languages directly into English to save all this time. Now, I've been hearing discussions all day, policy discussions on the value of Gen AI and the risks of Gen AI. But I have to say, 
I think we sometimes forget that Gen AI is a part of the AI story. And there are serious concerns that are around hallucinations. We don't know if the Transformers paradigm can even fix it. But there are many other aspects, for instance, automatic speech recognition, which unleash incredible opportunities to automate a lot of manual holdups, improve productivity, especially in developing countries to expedite our systems. Automatic speech recognition, unfortunately, is largely talked about in the context of better subtitles for our videos and movies. But here's an application where you can take it to our justice systems and actually improve productivity in the courtrooms. And our results are already speaking volumes. We're a young organization. Uh, even though this work has been in the making for the last 12 years, since my first day in the courtroom, as a, an organization, we're young. But we're already partnering with five state high courts, implementing these solutions in every courtroom of these high courts and every district courts of these states in multiple languages, from Malayalam to Kannada to Hindi to English. And in our pilots, we are finding that by simply using this product, you're able to cut down case resolution times by almost 50%, which means a bail hearing, which on average would have taken, say, 60 to 70 minutes, is now taking 30 minutes to transcribe and finish, doubling the number of bails a single court can take up in a single day, multiply that by the weeks and months into the hundreds of thousands of courtrooms across the country, and you can already sense the kind of impact that we think we are on to. The other huge advantage is that we started with this as an India solution, but when word went around on LinkedIn, especially my law school classmates, many of whom are now young judges in other countries, we realized that because of our shared legacy of colonialism, this problem is actually in multiple countries around the world, multiple common law countries around the world that actually use very similar legal lingo and language, and as a result of which we already have interests for collaborations in Nigeria, Kenya, and Bangladesh, because the legal systems are the same. And therefore, we believe you're on the cusp of being a global solution for the global south to end judicial delays and improve access to justice. We put up a great team, and at the leadership, we have people who've committed themselves to these careers. I studied law at Harvard Law School, economics at Oxford and Harvard Kennedy School. I worked at BCG, World Bank, and the government and solved all kinds of problems. And I'm now bringing this interdisciplinary experience to solve this multidimensional problem. Our chief impact officer studied economics at Cambridge and Oxford, has a PhD from LSE, worked with the World Bank and the Ministry of Finance, and is working on generating rigorous evidence so that you can truly quantify the impact of this AI intervention in courts and future interventions so that we know what the scale of the problem is and what the impact of the solution is. And our CTO is an IIT engineer who worked in leading startups but now wants to use AIs for social good. And we want to bring this interdisciplinary experience to solve this multidimensional problem. We are also being supported by a host of organizations. We are incubated at MIT, Oxford, and, and Microsoft. We are supported by Fast Forward. Kevin is here, one of the best tech accelerators in the world. Uh, multiple high courts, multiple state governments, and are partnering with organizations like JPAL so that we ensure that the impact is rigorously evaluated and quantified. When I was a lawyer in a courtroom, the glamorous thing would be to get a bail in one courtroom or to argue a civil rights case in another courtroom. But very quickly, as I said, you realize these are very individual wins in the face of a larger broken system. But we now believe that we're on the cusp of unleashing hundreds of thousands of bails and civil rights cases by simply converting words into justice. And we hope you'll join us. Thank you. Amazing, amazing work. Congratulations. Um, I have a question uh, re regarding the, you know, the veracity or the authenticity of the translation. I think other than the legal field, probably the medical field is the only other field where the integrity of the transcript is so critical. So how do you solve for that? Great question. So one, and you know, my stenographers all, often also come up with Prior to that, saying that this won't do a good job, and are you taking away our jobs? And we have to clarify that this is actually a co-pilot. This is not going to work without the human supervision of the judges and the stenographers, because as you said, it's very meticulously prepared. So to just to create what happens in a courtroom, you have a screen 
facing the judge, the lawyer, and the witness, and a screen facing the stenographer, and everything the stenographer is typing is being scrutinized not just by the judge, but by the defense counsel, the prosecution counsel, because every word determines the outcome of the case. So this is naturally a setting where human supervision is very high and is not going to be replaced. But secondly, with the feedback loops, with every correction and edit made in the system, we believe the errors are only going to go down. So in a sense, this is a large exercise of deploying a model and working with stenographers and judges across courtrooms to help us get better at transcribing speech to text, legal language especially, and a combination of better technology and continued hum human supervision, I think is to ensure that whatever goes into the record is, ma is meticulously recorded. And finally, third, this is the first time that we're going to actually enable capturing the audio recordings of the file. So if you want to ever go back to the original source of truth, we are going to enable cross-verifying that uh, to ensure that nothing is misrepresented in court.